Welcome back to IGN Summer of Gaming. I'm Ryan McCaffrey, and it's time to check in on Google Stadia. They've uh, had their launch last fall. They've been making a, a renewed push to get some eyeballs and hands on their service. So I'm joined by uh, three folks tied to Google Stadia today. First, I've got Jack Buser, the director of games at Stadia. Hello, Jack. Hello, hello. And then uh, Mark Alexis Cote, the executive producer on Gods and Monsters at Ubisoft, who's also uh, done some Stadia work. Welcome back. Thank you. Hi. And from Robot Entertainment, they are working, their team is working on a, uh, an, an exclusive game for Google Stadia. The design lead there, Jerome J Jones, excuse me, Jerome Jones, welcome. Hi. Guys, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, well, let's just, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Uh, Jack, you are you have, you win, okay, buddy. Your background, your 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 room there that you're in, is is imp it's better than all of ours, okay. Let's let's uh, <laughs> just take your bow. It's fine, but no, that is a that is one heck of a setup you got. Can, real quick, because we've got a, we've got some time. What are the just what are the oldest consoles like? What are the classics you've got back there? You've got some rarities. Yeah, I, my collection actually goes all the way back to a Fairchild Channel F, if you remember that one. That was even before wow. my time. I think it was just a couple of years old when that came out. Uh, but, you know, across the top, you got the Intellivision, you got ColecoVision, Atari 2600. But then you got some more recent stuff, like I got a couple Neo Geos, and there's even an Atari Jaguar yeah, down here. Wait, which way? Yeah, with, oh, and yeah. with the CD-ROM <laughs> attachment. So it, it's super impressive. It, your, your gaming credentials are secured. And actually, so Jack, I did want to start with you. Uh, let's let's just check off the the address the elephant in the room. Uh, the I think we can all agree the, the launch last fall probably not what you guys were hoping for from a public reception perspective. I'm curious what have you and your team learned from launch and how have you adjusted your strategy moving forward? Oh, we've learned so much. You know, I was working on Stadia uh, or even projects before we even called it Stadia for years before we launched uh, late last year. And, um, you know, in those early days, it was all about just getting games up and running, trying to get them to compile, trying to get them to stream from the cloud. Uh, we ran a big test, actually, with Mac here um, uh, called Project Stream in 2018, where we streamed Assassin's Creed Odyssey to people all over the U.S. And we had a pretty good sense that the technology was working really, really well. Uh, so our goal for launch was really to bring in sort of the first wave of gamers and give them the best possible experience we could. Uh, we made sure that everybody that came in had our controller, had a Chromecast Ultra so they could play in 4K up on the big screen TV. And it was really about just proving that the technology worked. Um, we launched in 14 countries on that day and i remember thinking yeah. wow you know i've never worked on a platform a digital platform that launched in that many countries all at once um, and it just worked and it's really a testament to google's engineering that they could just flip a switch and up we were running in people's living rooms all over the world really all over europe and north america um, so we really just wanted to get it out there get it in the hands of the first wave of gamers and just get that feedback. And from that feedback, to your point, you know, we've really made some adjust, adjustments. I'd say most significantly, uh, we've actually rolled out our Stadia Pro free trial. So really what that means is anybody that wants to just check out Stadia can come in and at no cost, just register for the trial. And you got a whole month to play about, I think right now I counted in the app, we've got about 18 games in there that you can play, you know, across all different genres made from developers all over the world and really see if Stadia is for you, you know, see if you're internet yeah. connections up to snuff see if it's you know playable and you, you like what you see and if you do stick around so uh, i'd say that's probably the most significant uh, adjustment we've made is now you don't need to buy anything you just come in as long as you got a chrome browser and a, you know laptop or a computer in you, in you come it doesn't matter if it's a chromebook or a mac or a pc pretty much anything will work so i don't even need the uh, the stadia controller for that no, you can take any controller you have laying around. If you've got an Xbox controller, a DualShock, you know, just plug it into your laptop, off you go. If you don't even have that, I mean, mouse and keyboard works as well. Uh, but I do recommend plugging in a controller. A lot of the games were designed for controllers. So, uh, you know, if you have one laying around, you probably do. Just plug it into your laptop and off you go. Stadia will automatically recognize what you have plugged in. And you don't need, there's no download, there's no install, there's no nothing. It just, it's like suddenly you're running games in 4K in your browser. It's kind of crazy. Well, uh, speaking of, of games designed for controller, uh, Jerome, you are making a game 
that is exclusively for Stadia in the form of Orcs Must Die 3. So how does that influence your thinking? That sort of, you know what you're, you've got a very t specific platform you're targeting at, at launch here. So on both big and small levels, I'm kind of just curious, how how does the Stadia factor influence your your design thoughts, both both big and small? Well, back originally when we started seeing Stadia, it was really quite a long time ago, and Orcs Must Die wasn't really even part of the thought then. But when when they talked to us about maybe bringing Orcs Must Die three to Stadia, uh, the 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 concept sort of of the scale and the potential of things brought about our initial idea of war scenarios, which is a big feature in Orcs Must Die 3. Um, and war scenarios to the fans are gonna be much bigger than fans are used to in the previous Orcs games. Uh, much bigger space, a battlefield, a ca you're still doing the same thing, you're defending the rift, but um, it's on a much, much bigger scale. And uh, I'm, I'm sure people will start to see the footage of that stuff soon, but to put it in perspective, um, in an old orcs scenario or a regular orc scenario, if you will, you might see, you know, a hundred orcs in a single wave, but now that number is dramatically bigger. You'll see as many orcs in a single war scenario wave as you would see in an entire scenario of the previous game. So uh, that was, got purely influenced by the whole idea of, you know, being on Stadia, and uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty impressive. I think the first time people see the war scenarios, they'll be uh, they'll be pretty excited. I mean, Jerome, is it is it in a sense like d d designing for a console where you're kind of you know you have all this power with the the Stadia cloud, and and you're just going to be pushing that to everyone, no matter what their their end user device is. Is it so? Is it sort of is it sort of easier in a sense that way? Well, the coolest thing about it is that once we get the war, I, I'll keep using the war scenario as an example because that's really sort of where we push some of the limits a little bit. But the coolest thing about it is in the end, once we get the war scenarios good, like running how we want them to run and feeling how we want them to feel, it's always going to be the same experience to anybody who plays on Stadia. So it doesn't matter if you have a crappy computer, if you, it doesn't matter where you're at and where you play, if you're playing on Stadia, everybody's gonna get the same experience, which is, you know, right. that's different than in the past, right? You, you In the past, people were used to like turning down their graphics or doing X, Y, and Z to get the game to run better, depending on the stuff they owned. And uh, it's really, it's comforting knowing that what we experience at the office on the war scenarios is what everybody will get to experience when the game ships. Uh, Max, so you helped bring, as we mentioned earlier, Assassin's Creed Odyssey to Stadia. So I'm curious, what did you learn from that experience, and how are you now taking that knowledge and using it to inform your future projects with cloud-based gaming in mind? Well, I would say that we um, we were privileged to be pretty much one of the first partners uh, for uh, for Google uh, partnering on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I remember uh, meeting with Jack uh, in California to, uh, to discuss this uh, right in the middle of summer. And it was uh, the minute I had played a game on Stadia, I knew what this technology could do. And I really wanted Assassin's Creed Odyssey to be the first game out of the gate to support it. I would say like the first things that we uh, that we learned were certainly about porting the engine to uh, the Assassin's Creed engine to a brand new environment that's more Linux based uh, using the Vulkan API, which is not something that we traditionally support within Ubisoft. And doing that work uh, allowed us to uh, was very beneficial for for Ubisoft in a way because we uh, we then shared that knowledge uh, with the entire company allowing us to bring pretty much the entire portfolio and the, all the upcoming games to, uh, to Stadia, which uh, I would explain, I would say that partnering very early with Google on this uh, allowed us to, uh, to uh, gain an edge on, on this platform uh, in a way with, uh, with the rest of our portfolio. So a lot of, uh, of learning to work with a new partner uh, being able to shape as well, I would say, the, uh, the pipeline, the development uh, tools 
uh, so that uh, they work to our liking was something that was very interesting as well. Well, I guess, you know, it does make sense. Ubisoft historically is, is always embraces uh, new platforms of all kinds really early on. So it's, uh, it's cool to see. So uh, for, the, for all three of you, what, what, as the three of you see it, is the biggest obstacle to overcome with just really like a psychological hurdle, just trying to get gamers to embrace and accept cloud-based gaming? You know, the resistance for some people, uh, they're, they're sort of uh, attached to the idea that, oh, I don't physically own it. It could be shut off and be taken away from me at any time. So for, I'll start with Jack on that. Is What do you think that, that biggest obstacle is uh, to, get, to get through uh, to customers sort of on the psychological side? Sure. I mean, strangely enough, I think one of the biggest obstacles is just getting people to try it. Because once they try cloud gaming, especially with Stadia, um, they generally fall in love with it. I mean, I've shown this technology to people all over the world, even before it launched. Uh, after it launched, we see people come flooding in, especially after we've launched the Stadia Pro free trial and people play it. And by and large, folks are just saying, wow, you know, this really works. Like this feels like I'm playing on a local PC or game console, um, but there's nothing here. It's just my old laptop with a browser. Um, so just getting people to try, you know, they generally figure out like that the technology really, really works. Um, in terms of like local media versus, you know, downloadable media versus streaming, it's one of those things where just like in movies and music, we've seen, you know, generations of technology, you know, technology improved to the point where now, you know, you're streaming movies, you're streaming music. And yeah, there's still people out there that like to listen to music on vinyl record. And that's totally fine. In fact, I do it myself. Um, but we really wanted to adopt like the state of the art technology to really push the industry forward and push forward what a game could be. And, and it really is streaming technology that enables us to, to achieve this. Um, I always give the example of, you know, I'm a dad, my daughter, um, you know, she's a teenager now. And uh, I have all these photos that I used to keep on my hard drive on my computer of her growing up. And I was always so nervous. If anything ever happened to those photos, what would I do? And it wasn't until the cloud services like Google Photos uh, came along and I could upload all of these photos to the cloud. And it just felt so, so much more secure that they were in a place where like if my basement flooded, you know, hopefully not, um, or anything like that, they were in a place that were safe. And so, you know, having these games in these giant data centers, the same data centers that host these photos, it just, they're in just such a secure location. It just makes me feel good about, you know, being able to preserve this stuff for the future. Jerome, have you run into any uh, resistance of, of trying to get people to try Orcs Must Die? It's like, it's, no, it, it, just the fact that it's, it's not on a physical machine somewhere. Sure. I mean, if you, if you read the internet, you know, there's always going to be people. I mean, change is hard, right? A lot of people just aren't up for it. But I, I think you just got to think, do you like Netflix? Do you like Spotify? I mean, it works, right? You just got to try it. I, to me, it's like a f mobile LAN party. Like you could just take your games wherever you go. You, if you're a con console control console player, you can take your controller with you, and your games are with you. It's you can play anywhere. I, I, people just have to try it. I think once people start trying it, it'll make more sense, and I I think you'll see. Uh, I think you'll see cloud gaming become a much bigger thing. I get it when people are like, I I, I need to hold the game in my hand, and getting rid of your game boxes. What we started getting rid of game boxes and going to downloadable games quite a while ago, and it was hard for some people to like. I know people who still have every game box they ever owned, but I, I think know. Jack's one of those people. I am one of those yeah. people. Yes. <laughs> and, it may, and, it, and it makes a lot of sense, right, Jack? I mean, it, it means something to people, but uh, you know, I think uh, I think the whole uh, like quarantine thing has really shined a light on. The, the the concept of stadia and cloud gaming it's it's really it's really made a lot of things easy and uh, and while we're devving up the end of orcs must die three we've really learned how powerful it can be and how helpful it can be to the, even the dev process so i think more people start trying it you'll see people come around pretty quickly well i've just got a minute left with you guys i wanted to go around the table i'll start with mac first on this i'm curious what is the strangest place that any that you have played I mean, your game or anything on Stadia from like, you know, a penthouse in Dubai or a, a private jet over the Atlantic, like, you know, that's, that's the promise of this technology. So is, do you have sort of a strange place that you've, that you've tried it out, Mac? Well, 
I wish there were as a place as sexy as what you were describing. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, but I do remember uh, playing an infamous demo from uh, a game formerly known as Gods and Monsters in uh, the middle of a street in LA on an Android phone that I tricked into connecting to an iPhone. Uh, and uh, I could play, despite the, uh, I would say the cellular connection being very poor in LA, uh, I could stream uh, Gods and Monsters right in the middle of the street. Uh, walking next to people who had absolutely no idea uh, that I was uh, walking around the street with a very top secret game. And uh, I was super excited because uh, Jack uh, and the team at Google had lent me uh, a prototype of their SDK for, uh, for mobile. And I was just so excited to try it that I had to try it in the middle of the street. Nice. Uh, Jerome, real quick. Well, it's clear that Jack is the only one in a penthouse in Dubai. If you look at the back of his room and everything, it looks, but, uh, for us, <laughs> for us, uh, or maybe a basement in Dubai, um, for us, it's been mostly the fact that we're, we're having to dev from home to finish up the game. So it's just, it, it, it's just fairly simple to move from room to room, even out on my back porch where there's a television, uh, and, uh, test the game, dev the game, you know, it's just, uh, shined a light on the convenience of, of Stadia's potential. All right. The producers are in my ear. We are out of time, gentlemen. IGN Summer of Gaming must move on. But this uh, this Stadia panel was fun. I really appreciate it. It's great to check in and kind of see where the tech is, see how you developers are thinking about it. So uh, Jerome from Robot, Mac from Ubisoft, and Jack from Google Stadia itself. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, we'll be back with more Summer of Gaming coming up next.